Oh, Andrea Tessman. Yes, Kirk Buckner. You picked a, for the, today's episode an Irish band, but they're not Irish. But they tried to be. And they're a one hit wonder, but they're not. And yet, this is a song that I think a lot of people, myself included, have really turned around on. I didn't like this as a kid. I didn't Did. know this as a kid. Well, you I wouldn't. think I was first exposed to this in the, well, I was still a kid-ish, but it, uh, probably more a teenager. And one of those random CD compilations of party hits or something. This would have been on a lot of them. This, uh, and yeah, and that's where, again where our age difference sort of happens because I, I certainly remember all of this. And you've clicked on this or you downloaded this or you're listening this, to this in your car and you should because too raw, too raw, lua, ra, 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 ra. We're looking at, yeah, I know I didn't get it right. That's why you're giving me that look, but that's okay. Dexie's Midnight Runners, possibly one of the dumbest sounding band names of the 80s. Uh, yeah, let's let's name our band after drugs, and that would the current day equivalent would be Molly's Midnight Raver. Yeah, yeah that, that could that could work, or Methy's Tooth Decay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Dexy is is speed basically. It's a type mm -hmm. of speed. Yep. So it and it was more to like stay up all night and party, which they did. Uh, I actually did a deep dive on this group a few years ago. I and I know I've mentioned this before, but I, I've been always going. I'm a disciple, not a disciple, but I'm a, a current viewer of acclaimedmusic.net, which looks at all the all the hits, not necessarily the hits but what the critics loved year by year and compile that. And Dexie's Midnight Runners is not just represented by one song that, that we know, uh, Come On Eileen, that we'll be talking about, but it also had another song called Gino. And from that, I did a deep dive then of just a lot of their music, came to really like a lot of it and learned that they were pretty successful out in the UK. Uh, but before that, like so many in the late 70s, I guess we're going to be talking about Kevin Rowland a lot. I got a... Well, he's I, basically the only person that stayed with it through 38 iterations. And it's pretty much his vision. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin's a weird dude. Uh, he's someone who I'm, I enjoyed listening to. Not all of his music. There were some pretty shitty covers uh, that, that he did in the late 90s and, and his dress wearing phase that we'll get to. Which, but okay whatever oh geez ivan sorry one second there's a giant spider i need to stick the cat on it oh all right well ivan, come here. Come here. today's episode is brought to you by ivan the cat and a spider i no longer feel guilty every time my Halloween. dog decides to, to interrupt it's ivan hi spiders ivan. are his favorite snack Jump, jump, jump. This should be one of those times where I almost wish I, I edited things and I, okay. I just don't. So, oh, <laughs> all well. right. The cat's on the case. He's just about, to, yeah. The cat's on the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. Did that guy ever go to number one? I don't think so. so Ke Ke I don't think so. Yeah. So Kevin was in a band called the Killjoys. Uh, did you listen to some of their music from the late 70s? I didn't, but it was more punk. It was a punk band. It was, yeah. it, it was, it was okay. But I mean, like it sounded like a shit ton of other British punk bands of the seventies, nothing special, nothing terrible. It was there. But what I found real interesting is what was going on around in Northern England at the time. And eventually we're going to get to Tainted Love, <laughs> which was also uh, part of this whole concoction let's say apparently in the late 70s what was going on in northern england was a bunch of young youngsters were discovering old soul albums and the more obscure the better mm -hmm. 
And Kevin was a huge part of that. And hence the first hit when they broke off and became Texas Midnight Runners, Gino was about Gino Washington, somebody who I wasn't familiar with, listen to some of his stuff, pretty damn good. Yeah. And, and yeah, how- they had this weird, like, they were, yeah, they were like doing speed and listening to old soul. And as you said, the weirder, the better, but like this kind of crazed, fast paced soul. Not so much the weirder, but the more obscure. Yeah. You know, it, it was like, look what I discovered that nobody gave a shit about 12 year, years ago. But we still do that. Sure. It's still a thing. Oh, you've probably never heard of it, but this is what I'm into. This seems like something that I guess a modern day hipster would do. Yes. And if there's anyone that we've ever covered that seems like an annoying hipster, it's Kevin fucking Roland. And with all due <laughs> respect to this guy, again, I, I, I'm digging this guy's music from, no, I, I can't say beginning to end, but a lot of his stuff. Uh, but I don't want to meet this guy. He sounds entirely intolerable. Yes. Like he he wouldn't let he wouldn't let band members talk to the press. He dictated exactly what they wore mm-hmm. in all their performances. At one point, he even forced them all to go running together. I read that too. Yeah. No wonder people kept leaving on mass over and over again. Well, look, look, we should look at their first look. And here, oh, here's another word I never heard of five years ago, but it, maybe because I'm not in the Comic-Con scene. Uh, cosplay. Costume play? You've never heard of cosplay? Well, not, not five years ago, I, I first did. All right. It's become a much bigger thing. Sure. In- but, it, but you would, because, I mean, you're all, you also uh, you, you do the makeup artist thing on the side, right? Not so much anymore, but yes, I used to. Okay, yeah. So, like, if there if, if there would ever be a Halloween party, although I don't think we ever went to one together, I would have no doubt that you'd probably win that contest. I had some pretty good costumes over the years. I, yeah, I, I, I'm sure you did. I tried. I, I wanted to do one with Pauline, my lovely Asian wife, which would be I'd be John Lennon, she would be Yoko Ono. My sign would say "Give peace a chance," or would say "When he dead, I make money." No. Yeah. That would have worked, no? Yeah. It's actually pretty funny. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Came up with that. Came up with that myself. So their their first thing in that Geno era, going back to Dexies, they were uh, they look like longshoremen or what they think longshoremen would look like. Mm-hmm. All showing up with uh, the the short black leather jackets and the wool hats. Basically looking like Colin Farrell, circa 1999. <laughs> that's a good, yeah, that's a good comparison. Yeah, I just, just came up with that. And this isn't necessarily new. Uh, bands have been doing this, looking, trying to come up with a look. But do you get the feeling when you were going back on all these back interviews and it was basically Kevin's way or the highway? Oh, for sure. He entirely dictated everything that happened in that mm-hmm. band. There was, and I think it was actually right before Come On Eileen, he heard one of the offshoots of his bandmates um, had incorporated right. quite successfully the string section. So mm-hmm. he decided that his horn players now had to learn strings. Now, I don't know if you know very many musicians and horn players and string players, you're not going to no. get a trombone player to play the fiddle. It's a very different skill set. Well, didn't this, and this, this is where I think a lot of them still worked on that album, but then he was getting more people there and then they took off. Yeah, well, he realized that maybe his horn section wasn't the greatest at string instruments. Yeah. So he got some actual, well, I think they were music students, but they it, were quasi professionals. Yeah. And then the horn section was like, oh, we don't feel important anymore. And they fucked off. Because they weren't. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, essentially, if you didn't know this at the time, and I didn't, I would have, I assumed for years that this was an Irish band. And what, and (laughs) Ivan strikes again. He's trying to break into the treat jar. Oh, the, the spider didn't do it, did it? No, I think it just whetted his appetite. 
Nice. Yeah. She'd just have a jar full of spiders. It was like, like that big. My God, what kind of island do you live on? I thought, I thought I had a lot of bugs down here in Barbados. Uh, no, it's spider season. They all like coming inside at this time of year. And They're mostly harmless, but I like... much prefer just to let the cat snack on them than have to deal with them myself. And they move fast. And yeah. So I'm trying to figure out as, and yeah, he went full in on this. So like one of the women that he hired for all that, he had her change her name. Mm-hmm. To to El- Helen O'Hara. Well, I think she was already named, more Irish. I think Helen was already her first name. It was. Like, like she's this I think guy. he also had, I think he had a few other band members change the names. Maybe not yeah. legally, but he kind of forced them to go by different names. And this is the look that pretty much everyone in North America knows Dexy's Midnight Runners for. I, I don't know what to call it other than stylish farmers who will put on made up dirt. Like, uh, I, I, I don't know what he thought this, this look was. I mean, they're all in these jean overalls, mm-hmm. bandanas and scarves everywhere. It's like a cross between farmer and like old school train engineer. <laughs> yeah. Like different overalls, but the same concept with the, the bandana scarf Ooh. and the and the short pants, that got me too. Like all of their pants were were like rolled up or short. Yeah. Thank um, God this trend didn't take off in that time frame. Like I can well, I mean, a lot of people did roll up the jeans. I remember that, but I don't think this had a whole lot to do with it. Did it? I don't think so. And again, it just feels like okay, Kevin went into an antique antique store. It's like, all right, uh, I, I want to look like uh, like a dirty hillbilly. Mm-hmm. He's trying to figure out what that might look like. He has no clue. I mean, if this group of people just showed up at my farm to work and they answered an ad. Because back back then, kids, they answered ads in the paper. You see, uh, you you'd hand them a pitchfork and a hoe and tell them to get to work. And they wouldn't know what to do with it. They wouldn't have a they wouldn't have a goddamn clue. But this, I guess, we should look at the song itself. Before we do that, I, I want to just confirm to everyone that I'm not the dirty one. You are. <laughs> so, so, so in preparation for this, you sent me a couple memes that uh, your good friend uh and now my new facebook friend brad uh had sent you that you you, you sent to me so can, can you share with the people what, what they are well you know i went to a party the other day and it was dancing and they played the twist and i did the twist and they uh played the macarena and i did the macarena and they played jump and i jumped then they played come on eileen and i got banished for life and then there was an actual picture that you sent of a costume. I, it was of um, it was of a woman at a costume party where the theme was um, famous song names, and she was wearing a name tag that said Eileen. And you can probably imagine what's going on there. Yeah, uh, as uh, around the same era, as Easy Top said, she wore a pearl necklace. Only it wasn't an, on the, you know, I, I I didn't know what that meant back then. That whole album was full of innuendo that 12-year-old Kirk didn't get. Mm-hmm. Actually, it was years before I even understood, I got the six, now give me the nine. <laughs> Maybe because I've been holding this shitty four for years, but anyway. Uh, so. so yeah, let's go back to the <laughs> actual song because I think that, I think the song is, has very different meaning in North America than it did in Great Britain. I think when I heard it and everything, I heard him singing in this pinched falsetto. You can't really understand the lyrics except for, yeah. come on, Eileen, oh, I swear. And you can, you can understand the chorus. You can't understand the words where he's actually talking about the kind of dreary, workaday, boring world of his parents. And it seems to be... But- Oh, sorry, go ahead. It it really the the first couple of verses are about breaking away from the doldrum 
ball and chain lifestyle that you just are forced to accept. But, and but there's it's a line where he said, we're not, not us, we're too young and clever. So there's this optimism of youth and of, of escapism. And that's what the video does. Yeah, and then that's where the video, yes, the video really does show that. Yeah. And then that's where it gets into the innuendo and the sexual undertones. And it becomes this, I mean, I suppose sex is the greatest form of escapism. Um, especially young people filled with optimism of a better life. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I felt with the video, like, cause it starts off like the first 30 seconds, it's all these throwbacks to their parents, or I guess more really the, the mother. Johnny Ray. Finding over, yeah, a guy named Johnny Ray, who I barely know who that was. I had to look that up too. I mean, I, I, I yeah, I mean, I, I knew that was a star, but that was like a pre-rock matinee idol. Mm -hmm. And you just see these, these flashbacks of these people full of hope, but it didn't work out. And I think also what has to be painted, the early 80s, England sucked, mm -hmm. in like in terms of their economy. Uh, and there, there wasn't a lot of hope for a lot of people, just like the late 70s, there was a whole period of just dreariness, uh, which also doesn't help that you live on a rainy island. You'd know something about that. Yeah, we get a lot more optimism on this rainy island. That's true. That, 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 that is very true. And then you just get off, get off to these, these dirty farmers who can't find work because, well, they're singing and they're also, and it's, in a, in a very unbusy town. Yeah, there was nothing. <laughs> oh, the other funny thing is everyone, even the ones who aren't in the band in that video are wearing the same stupid coveralls or overalls. Even a baby in a stroller was, was yeah. dressed like, like this, like this. Like, what the hell? But all right, I mean, if, if you're gonna go all in, go all in. So yeah, I, I honestly think that for, um, so reading some comments on, on the music video and on some forums about this song, mm -hmm. there's, there's a few Brits who really were like, you know, it, it, the song really brings back nostalgia of, you know, growing up in that really rough time in England or in London and having hope and optimism for the future. Whereas I think if you ask most North Americans, sure, the video was everywhere people mm -hmm. watched it but the song has stuck around because it's interesting melodically mm -hmm. um and anything that can be turned into a party chant which it did does well yeah it became a party song very quickly and therefore it doesn't matter what the meaning behind it is all anybody remembers is his pinched crooning and that that false end and then the slow um, acceleration but, as it catches up and right. speeds up. Like at the end too, it's almost like this whole march, like we're, we're like the bar is going to stop. Yeah. And you're stopping dancing and then you get your, your beer up. And and obviously, we, you and I can't talk that much about what this would have meant in England. In Canada, at least I'm going back in my memory, just going back and looking at everything around it, no song sounded like this. I don't think any song anywhere sounded like this. Mm -hmm. He took three very different musical styles and really ripped off other songs. Mm -hmm. and then crammed them all together in a way that was so disjointed that it actually worked. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense. From a music theory point of view, this song shouldn't work. But it did. I mean, it's, a, it it's like a Bohemian Rhapsody. There's... Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, when, when I watched that movie, mm -hmm. and, you know, like, there's, there's that Mike Myers character where he's playing a composite of, of all that. Yep saying that this song would never work I would have been that guy too because yeah nothing had ever, there was nothing like it there was no reason that that should have been successful and it was and I, I 
I don't even know that people still understand why, why it is successful. This one stood out. It got labeled as a new wave, which it isn't. Uh, uh -uh. But it's, all, it's on a lot of new wave compilations. It's on a lot of one hit wonder compilations and it from a North American perspective, that is accurate. Uh, I do encourage a lot of people to listen to their first two albums. The third album is a little pompous to me because then they, they went through another stylistic change. And this is like where they, I thought they were trying to be Roxy music only again, it's like, well, okay, we're going to get all these like vintage suits, but they weren't great suits. So they, they didn't, lo didn't look, again, cosplaying. Yeah. This just, this guy was a hipster before we knew what that was. I again, because I'm also... such a fashion plate with my uh, shirt <laughs> here uh, from uh, representing the Wayland Watani group, the, the, the fake company from Alien with my Seattle Supersonics app. I'm so cool. Hey, whatever works. Yeah. Um, I think he, well, look in, you know, at, at one point, despite writing this massively popular song, he ended up bankrupt and mm -hmm. on welfare. Um, yeah. And then managed to restage a bit of a comeback. And then he, um, he was in rehab for years for mm -hmm. drug addictions. Like Gee, big he, shock when that's your band name, huh? Yeah, right. But yeah. he also, yeah, he um I, I think he had some or still has, he's still alive, but there's there's Just some this. mental health issues going on there too. And then you look through his pictures throughout the years, he goes back and forth with a pencil thin mustache. Here, here's something, kids. If you have a little pencil thin mustache. Don't, you're a douche. Just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> Same with the chin strap goatee. No. Oh yeah, no. No. No neck beards. Is the neck beard, that's, you know, that's actually something I, I know we're going way off, but I don't mind. Is, is that basically where you don't sort of like shave a line here or like what exactly is that or is that just if you just have a just a natural it's more when you like actually have hair on your neck but not really on your face yeah all right so if i so if i don't shave for a while for two weeks and it's everywhere that's okay i mean you look a little homeless but I'm i wouldn't married. say that makes you a neck beard I'm married i really don't give a shit but yeah <laughs> So yeah, they broke up in 86. Uh, he had a solo career, an interesting solo career. I sent you uh, a video of, this is actually during his, uh, it was, it, it was a, then a remake of his own video. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, what's he covering? You're just too good to be true, I think. I forget what's Something like that, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's a shit album, actually. It was, he did it was, a lot of remakes of his own music and- Yeah. But, but the, the album in question was in the late 90s. He did an album of covers. And this is also when he, he wore a dress in the video, which I don't even want to say for 1999 was bizarre because like Bowie did that 25 years before that. So I mean, like, but Kevin Rowland in a dress and then lifted up the dress to reveal his panties, lingerie. And at this point, he looked half homeless, half meth, methed out. And he probably was. I mean, he's not exactly a handsome guy. Mm -mm. Again, because I'm such a great looking guy, but still, uh, it, it was a weird look. He got booed off the stage in Glastonbury, apparently, that year. Oh, I didn't catch that. But... Yeah, he was wearing a dress. It's just like, look, what the hell are you doing, you weirdo? <laughs> it's and yeah then then he redid that or actually he just redid the video and, I, and apparently it's his grandson who i guess is i'm guessing from the video because he was lip syncing all that i'm guessing is the grandson well, said this is my grandson but i think it the kid's non-binary so i'm i'm if i'm if i'm being insensitive on I, I, i'm sorry i i don't know but I, I, either way it was just sort of like Again, it came off pretentious. See, like, see, I was ahead of the curve. Look at this. <laughs> Meanwhile, you showed a picture of Bowie in the whole thing before. 
What he was I was going to say, yeah, you're not being original at this point. No, no, you're, you're really not. Uh, I, I think we hit on why this song really worked, why it still does. It doesn't sound like a 40 year old song, a near 40 year old song. Mm -hmm. God, near 40 years, yeah, it is. It, it, it's timeless. It doesn't sound like anything else. Um, you know, there's definitely the Celtic influence, but then there's some 80s rock influence and there's some, mm -hmm. uh, some soul influence. Yeah. So if, if it had been sung by a different singer, I think it would have sounded a lot more soul Celtic fusion. Yeah. But I, his voice doesn't loan itself to soul, even though he keeps trying to sing soul. Um, but he still, his voice really makes the song. I don't particularly like his voice. Um, I, yeah, I, I couldn't do a concert of it for two hours. Trying too hard and he's, it's very pinched and but it works with what he's doing with the song. Well, I think it's also too, I mean, it's not like anyone could say to him like, uh, Kevin, maybe you want to tone it down. I'm like, see this mustache? You're wearing what I told you to wear, you <laughs> asshole. I, I know I should do that in English accent. I can't do it. My English accent, as you know, is only Michael Caine. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think he sounds like Michael Caine. So maybe I'll just move on from that. Ivan would do a better impression than I could. Um, mm. So I guess my parting words on this one, this one is, if you only know this band for the song, and I suspect that a lot of you, especially if you're on this side of the Atlantic too, give their first two albums a listen. Please do, do so. Maybe not necessarily look at them because it's a, it doesn't, well, frankly, I don't think it works for me, but it may not work for you, but I like, I, I like this overall group. And they did lose the Grammy to uh, the B Sharps. If you remember that Simpsons episode. <laughs> Baby on board. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Thought you might get that one. <laughs> um, any final words before I tell you what we've got next week? No, I think let's, uh, let's hear what steaming piece of crap you've got served up for me next week. How did you know it was crap? You know... It's it's more than a coin flip. It's it's tradition. Yeah, basically, it's a it's that Dungeons and Dragons eight sided die, um, and seven and of them are seven of them are crap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I've gone with I'm going to the '60s, so I want to make sure I wanted to try and get something from that decade. Uh, I'm going with a guy named Bobby Goldsboro, and he had a number one song called Honey. About his dead wife. Hmm. Interesting. And he plants a tree when his wife died. So every time he looks at the tree, thinks about honey. Later on, he had another hit called Watching Scotty Grow. That never went number one, but we'll talk about that one too. <laughs> I hope the tree wasn't called Scotty. <laughs> no, but I mean like... Uh, if that's not a pedophile anthem, I don't know what is. I'm watching All right. Scotty Grow. I do not know <laughs> this song, so I... It's terrible! Don't entirely look forward to this. It's, it's awful. It is some of the worst dreck you ever heard. And we're definitely going to offend people because it's going to be one of those AM songs that make people feel real happy. And they, they, they can really sympathize with this guy and his dead wife and... Man, my, my first wife died. I, that might be a happy song, actually. You know what? I think we should end it there. Hey, let's end it there and not hey. talk about a uh, homicide. I'm going to kill her. <laughs> you know, just if it just happened, you know, it's like, it would be like, meh, meh, meh. You know, I didn't think this. Anyway, thing. honey. Yes. And Looks with that, stay safe, everybody, and buy my book, Instant Classic, the story of Chavo Guerrero Sr., and listen to the other shows I got, because, hey, technically, this is a network. I mean, if PBS is on a, a lot of different places, that's a network, right? 
This is mm -hmm. a network. No mm -hmm. one watches them either. And I mean, really, what else you're doing? Everybody's still locked down or some form of quarantine. Yeah. So, so, so Occupy feel free. some of your time with us. Yeah, feel free to call us idiots. Other people have. Mm -hmm. We yeah. won't really contest it. We may call you an idiot back, but. Oh, no, we'll, we'll, we'll go in far more worse terms. <laughs> And well, and with that, let's all go back to the crevice of which we came.